Hello, friends. This is Gabriel. Welcome to Exploring the Quran and the Bible. There are an increasing number of inscriptions that have been discovered in Saudi Arabia, especially in the region that interests everyone who has questions about the emergence of Islam, the context of the Quran, so the region of the Hejaz around Mecca and Medina. But very rare are the inscriptions which can be clearly linked to an historical figure around the life of the Prophet Muhammad, but my guests today, who will be known to many of you, have brought to light one of these rare inscriptions. We'll be speaking about the fascinating story of this inscription and the possibility that it was written by one of Muhammad's own companions, Professor Ahmed the Jalad. Uh, welcome, happy to have you with me. Good to be here. Thank you. you. You are the Sophia Chair in Arabic Studies at The Ohio State University, and uh, Haytham, nice to have you back. Yeah, great to be here. Haytham Sidki is the Executive Director of the International Quranic Studies Association. Together, they have uh, worked on this fascinating inscription, and there'll be uh, there's an article that will be out around the time when we're releasing this video in uh, the Journal of Near Eastern Studies, uh, entitled, A Paleo-Arabic Inscription of a Companion of Muhammad, with a question mark. <laughs> so we'll be discussing, you know, why is there a question mark? Should should we, uh, how confident should we be that this is an inscription, in fact, of a companion of Muhammad? But I mean, this is really important stuff. This is an incredible discovery. Uh, the inscription um, uh, was found uh, in the city of Ta'if. And why don't we just start, Haytham, if I can ask you to begin um, by introducing, how did you find this inscription? How are you aware of it? Uh, where is it located exactly? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the, the inscription is located really in the heart of the city of Ta'if. You know, it's not out uh, in, you know, like a valley somewhere or, um, you know, out in the desert. And in fact, what happened was um, an individual, a, a Turkish calligrapher by the name of Yusuf Bilin, actually reached out to us. And uh, so it turns out that in the city of Ta'if, there's a mosque. Uh, and this mosque is, um, uh, it's said to have been built by Ali. And it's, it's uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib. And so it's it's an abandoned mosque, um, and people do visit it as a as a shrine. So they go there and they like they carve little things inside of the mosque, and people can go see it. And it turns out that if you just like turn the corner and look up a little bit, you'll spot a very prominent boulder about a hundred meters uphill from where this shrine is. Uh, and it seems that it just went unnoticed for a very long period of time until this particular individual saw it, took a picture sent it to us and said, hey, do you recognize this? And the answer was, well, we don't. But we, we saw how valuable and how important it could be. And then we had to get out there uh, and document it. I mean, uh, but I, I'm curious about uh, the shrine, uh, although we should be speaking about the inscription, especially. <laughs> but uh, why is it abandoned? And is it a place of Shiite piety, especially because it's associated uh, with Ali, who is the first imam for, for the Shia? Yeah, it could be. We don't, I mean, we don't know too much about it, but what, one thing we do know is that it's definitely, um, so like the, the Saudi government definitely discourages people from visiting the location. They have signs there that you should not perform any religious rituals here okay. and things like this, okay. uh, but really kind of the significance to those people who do make, you know, the pilgrimage to the site, um, you know, I'm not terribly aware of the details there. Yeah, yeah. So, but uh, this inscription, I mean, uh, this is sort of unusual that the inscription is right there. I mean, it's in the middle of Ta'if, which is a biggish city. Uh, what What is it like? Could you say a little bit more about sort of the buildings around and how did you actually see it? I mean, I know you were tipped off by your Turkish colleague, but uh, can you speak about, you know, when you actually found it? Yeah, absolutely. Like there's a there's a big boulder field. So at the very base of this big hill, uh, there's the mosque and then there's a big boulder field. And then to the right, there's like a vineyard, which we'll, we'll come to in a little bit. Um, and, you know, we we had like, you can say kind of approximate coordinates. And so we started hiking. And the moment you look up, you, you, you can't miss it. Like it's a very prominent boulder. And typically inscriptions of this nature are featured on, you know, these landmarks that are visible to people that are walking by and coming by, etc. So and then, of course, we surveyed the area around it because where there's one, sometimes there's more. Uh, but, at, and, you know, we didn't really find anything else. Um, but of course, not every inscription you find is is always that easy or that prominent uh, or densely populated of uh, of a location. So, um, you know, maybe... And, and these inscriptions are put in yeah. those prominent places, Haytham, because uh, folks would like them to be seen by passerbys. And because there's, there's, I mean, as we'll see in this inscription when we get to its contents, there's sort of a message, a pious message associated with them. So you want people to read it and, yeah, uh, sort of Absolutely. engage with it. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah. Uh, for sure, I led the, the fascinating. Uh, I think that that comes into the uh, yeah. the art of uh, of finding inscriptions, really, because it's a combination of uh, you know planning your mission well, but also having good local contacts. Because, like we said, this is it's not that nobody has ever seen this text before. Of course, it was seen by hundreds of people yeah. that come by. Walking it just by. Yes. nobody nobody really made a big deal out of it. No one appreciated necessarily its significance until recently, and then it gets online and 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 you know, is discussed there. So a lot of what you need is to have these local contacts to uh, and to reach out because you don't have the time to basically check every boulder. So you need to really have a good relationship right. with locals. Right. And, uh, and, um, and, you know, what we had, we had a very uh, good uh, local contact, a local uh, a Bedouin, in fact, named Inad uh, uh, Zaidi. And he, uh, you know, we would ask him when you're out pasturing your animals, have you seen you know, uh, rocks with writings on them and what have you. And, and he was sort of a, low, a kind of amateur enthusiast and he he loved to read the Islamic inscriptions, but he of course recognized pre-Islamic things as well. And we would spend, we spent a couple of days with him just wandering around in these, uh, in the pasture land really, where you have these rocky outcrops documenting things that of course he knew where they were. Um, and, uh, and if we would have, you know, gone back and tried to do it all from scratch, reinventing the wheel, we would have yes. not been as efficient. Yeah. So a lot of it really uh, comes down to that. And then, of course, there's just chance. So we knew, um, so the, the last inscription that Haytham and I published together was the Ri'a Zalala inscription. And uh, as we said in the article, this inscription was uh, uh, sort of, uh, was previously known. The panel was previously known. But, of course, it was published uh, more, than, uh, yeah, more than half a century ago. And we didn't have coordinates. We didn't really know exactly where it is. And if you ask locals where Ria Zalala is, I would, nobody really knows these names anymore, right? Okay. <laughs> so, okay. so how do we find it? And the way we we actually ended up finding it was uh, we, were, we were in the morning having breakfast and we were looking on YouTube. And there were some locals who had taken a YouTube video standing at this panel with the seated man and the inscriptions. And they were... Uh, I don't know how they interpreted They said it was something like Abraha soldier or something, some, something like that. Anyway, very funny. But they had found the text, so we knew where it was. And what we did is we sort of looked at the video. We tried to look at features in the landscape around the inscription, the arrangement of electrical poles. Then we went out to Google Maps. To figure out where they were. Okay. We figured out exactly where. They yeah. Were. We figured out which highway they were on, where it was. We knew the rough area, and we had it. We did. We ended up finding it in that way. So uh, you know, a lot of it is just a, a chance like that as well. That's lots extraordinary. Of, uh, now, yeah, the Ria Zalala, yeah. that the inscription, the, the story about discovering it through YouTube, mm. uh, that's mm. sort of out uh, in the desert, mm. uh, sort of yeah. you know, as you've you know, uh, it's not in the middle of the town, no. no. Right, you describe in detail. It's kind of one way mm. to get to Mecca, uh, mm. but mm. this inscription in Ta'if is in mm. the middle of the town, mm. and uh, I mean, your theory, which we'll be speaking about in some detail. Is that mm -hmm. um, well the the inscription uh, the one who wrote it uh, identifies himself as Hanzala ibn Abi Amir, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so we'll be um, uh, well. Uh, I should clarify this is what this is your theory about the identity of the inscription. He describes himself as Hanzala in the inscription, the one who wrote it as uh, uh, the son of Abd Amr. So we'll have to get into all those details. But did your Turkish colleague, did he know, was he able to read Hanzala? Did he know that it might be a companion of the Prophet uh, Ahmed? Or was this something that you guys figured out in studying the scripture? Oh, no, no. This is uh, this this issue. Um, uh, I think, yeah, people, uh, uh, when they read this, they this was discussed. Somebody posted on Twitter saying that this is a companion of the Prophet. Okay. The problem is. Um, so there was noise yeah. out there about this possibly being. Yeah. yeah, well, the, the point, yeah, so you, you can find two names. This is the point, is that you have you can find two names and say this is the, uh, and you read them immediately, and it, and it does strike you as that. So the first the first reaction you would have to such a text would be that this is a companion of the prophet. But the point is demonstrating that. It's one yes. thing just to say it. And yes. the point is actually following that argument through and really not, well, let's say not demonstrating that. We don't want to demonstrate something. We want to see whether that is actually the case, whether that identification is likely. Right, because we deal in probability here when it comes to uh, uh, history. We 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 really can't prove anything, but we want to say is that really the most plausible explanation for the identity yes. of this person? Yes. And so, um, so yeah. So like most of this material, it comes out on the internet first. It floats around. People throw ideas. So what we uh, try to do in this article really is bear that out. Is it indeed the best explanation for this individual? 
And, you know, we put some arguments out and uh, I think, uh, well, we can debate them. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's actually a yeah. question because uh, the location of the inscription in Ta'if, the mm. association of this figure possibly with Medina, we'll be getting mm. into his story uh, a little bit. Um, but Ahmed, to put it into a bit more context, I mean, why is this a big deal to potentially uh, have an inscription of a companion of Muhammad? Well, I think even it's a big deal, even if, we only had the second text, all right? So even we can even put aside whether this is a companion or not. I think the arguments are compelling. I think when we follow the argument through, that seems to be the most likely identification. But put that aside, the inscriptions are, both of these inscriptions are extremely important because, well, if you follow the kind of argument and the, and the, and the discourse surrounding um, Islamic origins, especially Quranic origins in the last you know, 20, 30 years, there has rightfully been um, a lot of skepticism, um, you know, towards our traditional view of things. And that skepticism sometimes, we need to know how far to go, whether it becomes extreme, whether it's justified skepticism. <laughs> and a lot of the discourse has come to the point where we say, look, there's just no, ev there's no evidence that there's anything like Arabic writing in the area of Mecca. Right. There's no there's no evidence for even the use of the Arab. Where, where do we see the use of the Arabic script? It's all in the north. It's Syria now in, in Tabuk area, but there's nothing in Mecca. Right. This is not the area where we get Arabic. Right. And other arguments have you know gone forth and tried to talk about the implausibility of a, a text. Forget the content, but just the text of the Quran being composed in an environment like Mecca or in this part of the Hejaz, Mecca, Medina, as you like. So these texts do uh, are important because they do establish that. In this area, whether you want to say it's Mecca or Medina, because we do obviously have contacts between these two places, but in this, in the Hijaz, in the central part of the Hijaz, the Arabic writing tradition, right, that we know in Prius is, is actually established. Yes. And people are positively yes. writing it in Arabic that we would identify as the Arabic that is later used to put the Quran uh, down in writing. So that argument, that, that skepticism, that like I said, there's justification to be skeptical. But we can now sort of say that's that's actually a little bit too far. That kind of skepticism goes just a little bit too far. Mm -hmm. There's no reason now at all. And now we have we have a number. We actually we have more inscriptions from the region that we haven't published. Huh? <laughs> so we'll, we'll talk about those in a bit. But there's no reason to push that far. In fact, in terms of let's say the script, the language, the text itself, uh, the Hijaz is completely uh, a plausible environment. Or something like the Quran. So that's huge. That's very significant, right? Because it helps us understand the limits of skept our skepticism. Yes. yes. The, uh, the, yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, also to sort of highlight the importance of the possibility that we're dealing with someone who would have known uh, the prophet. Uh, yeah. We don't, yeah. we don't have many other inscriptions no. um, of potential companions. Uh, no, no. Describe no. in the no. article that, well, there's, there's possibly one more, someone named Khalil ibn al-As. Uh, but this is uh, inscription is well south of Mecca, so this is potentially only our second inscription of a companion of the Prophet. Ahmed. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd say so. Yes. Um, so yes. So so then this being a historical figure, which is quite plausible indeed, um, that's that's also significant yeah. um, because what it what it does, I think, if you follow that through, is again we talk about skepticism, right? There's been a lot of skepticism directed towards. Uh, let's say, our Islamic period sources, um, where some people are have argued that, you know, a lot of this material is just, you know, literary invention. Right. Okay. The individual. So texts like this show that, I mean, you can't ever confuse the part for the whole. That's the most important thing. But that we're not talking about literary invention ex nihilo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are not made up people. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, you can you can get into the stories surrounding, that's another matter. But these are at least again we can be yes. we have to be really fair with our evidence this is a real person hmm? yes yes and and yeah. the nature of the inscriptions will and we'll get to this maybe further along but mm. maybe say something about the religious environment uh I think, right at the yeah. dawn of islam and yeah religion. yeah absolutely um, no matter yeah no matter how you uh no matter your opinion on the identification of this individual these are inscriptions from the dawn of islam yes absolutely yeah um, yeah. Haytham, I want to ask you a bit about uh, a thought of its relationship to Mecca, because inscription is not found in Mecca itself or Medina, but in the city of Ta'if. Uh, first of all, I think I should get out there the content of the inscriptions. And as Ahmed actually uh, already clarified, there's actually two. So I'll just give the 
uh, the English, uh, your English translations now, and then we could speak about the Arabic wording. But uh, we have one inscription on this boulder uh, that um, you studied, uh, which is in your name, our Lord, I am Hanzala. And then I think you've inferred son of Abd Amr. I urge you to be pious towards God. So that's one short inscription. And then the second name begins in the same way. In your name, our Lord. I am Abd al-Uzza or Abd al son of Sufyan. I urge you to be pious towards God. So uh, these are a very short inscriptions. The actual Arabic words are very important because they do say something about uh, the religious uh, context or rather the sort of vocabulary that um, might be used by monotheists. Um, but Haytham, can, can you speak a little bit first about uh, just Ta'if? How far is it from Mecca? Uh, why is it an important city? You, you gave an allusion before to a vineyard. I think there's a story associated with that vineyard. Uh, so could you kind of put it in context a bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Ta'if is about, you can say 40 miles, maybe 60 kilometers as the crow flies from Mecca. Uh, and it's at a much higher altitude. So, you know, Mecca sits at maybe, uh, I don't know, like a kilometer above sea level. And then we're, or maybe, I don't know, a thousand feet, roughly. Yeah. So a thousand feet above sea level, whereas Ta'if is like 6,000 feet. So it's much higher altitude. And it has like the environment is much more conducive to agriculture um, and compared to like the more semi-arid or fully arid climate that you get in Mecca, which is, uh, you know, kind of a valley region compared to what you have in Taif. So what's interesting is, you know, um, you know, in the, in the Islamic literature, uh, it was kind of uh, known that the Quraysh, which is the tribe that occupies Mecca, that the, the wealthy of them, the elite, they actually kind of had vacation homes or summer homes in Taif. So they owned property and they had wealth in Taif that's independent of Thaqif, which was like the main tribe of Taif themselves. Uh, and so one of those, uh, uh, you can say like summer homes or vacation homes was this vineyard that was owned by two, um, you know, two of the Meccan uh, elites. They were brothers, uh, you know, Shayba and Utba ibn Rabi'a. And uh, there's a story kind of that revolves around this and the prophet in Ibn Ishaq, which we can go into um, uh, if you'd like. But the general uh, pr principle here is that there is a connection between Mecca and between Ta'if. So the people, though they are Meccans, they live in Mecca, they do own land, they have wealth and et cetera established in the, in the city of Ta'if. And that Ta'if is an agri agricultural city. It produces a wide variety of uh, you know, fruits and barley and wheat and things like that. Of course, today there's modern irrigation, things like that, that produce a lot, a lot, uh, uh, other things. Um, but that's kind of the, the relationship between the two cities. Okay, great. And Ahmed, could you introduce us a bit to the nature of the Arabic script of this inscription? Uh, you know, as you indicate in the title, uh, this is what people now call Paleo-Arabic. Uh, that might be your term. Uh, well, yeah, actually that is a term that, um, uh, Waban Saeed Saeed and uh, and uh, and Rabban Ali Rabban uh, coined in their article on the inscriptions for Hima, um, and I liked it very much because what we're doing, what we want with the term, is uh, a concise way to distinguish this corpus of pre-Islamic inscriptions in the Arabic script, in the Arabic language, from uh, material produced in the Islamic period, and they are indeed. I think uh, different in many ways. Uh, sometimes it's hard to quantify those differences, but when you read enough of them, you get a feeling for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we can say in a clumsy way is pre-Islamic uh, Arabic script, Arabic language inscriptions, which is too clumsy because you want to distinguish, pre because in the pre-Islamic period, you have Arabic language inscriptions written in other scripts. Yes. So calling them old Arabic inscriptions doesn't work because yes. you have them written and calling them pre-Islamic Arabic doesn't work either. So paleo is sort of a nice uh, a term that captures that uh, all of those uh, valencies, okay? Um, and uh, you you have a you know you can compare it to established terminology like in uh, when referring to the, the to, to Hebrew and uh, Hebrew inscriptions, you have paleo Hebrew, for example, which is yeah. so so it, it actually fits, let's say, other uh, uh, you know established jargon in the field. So paleo Arabic refers to that uh pre-islamic arabic script inscriptions the earliest dated one we have uh comes from hima north of najran dated to 470 ad and uh using the uh, era of bostra so using the era of, Prov of provincia arabia which is uh, in the north which is very interesting maybe we have time to get because into that in the south yes 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 but so it's in the south but the people who are composing these inscriptions let's say in terms of uh, chronologically are oriented north 
Yes. Right. Yes. Their script is Northern. So they're thinking like Northerners. Yes. Whether they're travelers or not, we don't know. Are they locals? Are they are they an immigrant community? Or are they people who just are expressing their loyalties to, in, in, you know, <laughs> in some other ways? Many hypotheses. Uh, so the, uh, and uh, Leila Na'ame has, has done tremendous work in the last, uh, uh, you know, 15 years or so, demonstrating, even more than that, uh, demonstrating the evolution of the Arabic script, the Paleo-Arabic script, um, gradually from the Nabataean script, right? So there used to be a hypothesis that, you know, somehow Syriac had a role to play in this or that Arabic was taken from Syriac. This is even a, a hypothesis you can see in classical Islamic sources. Uh, and Leila has actually conclusively demonstrated that, you know, there's really no role for Syriac in this at all. Uh, some people still cling to some kind of Syriac loyalty and say things, funny, unscientific things like, well, there's a Nabataean mother and a Syriac father. But that doesn't mean anything scientifically. Is, <laughs> so I don't know what that what that's supposed to say. But anyway, Leila demonstrates indeed that you go directly from Nabataean to um, uh, to Paleo-Arabic. This happens. These, this transformation happens in the nor in north northwestern Arabia in the northern Hejaz. Uh, you and in this whole area, you can see you have documentation from the Nabataean period, early first millennium AD, until the rise of Islam, and you can see the gradual evolution of the script. Uh, as how far south did that go? Well, we know, for example, at Medina, at least at Yathrib, uh, the use of the Nabataean script proper. Um, was there, right? So you have people who actually wrote in the Nabataean script that were at Yathrib. Okay. Uh, just, okay. But this far south, going down to Mecca and Taif in this area, we did we failed to find, or we did not find, uh, maybe it's not a failure, we just didn't find any examples of the Nabataean script or of any transitional Nabateo Arabic, or what Leila now calls the developing Arabic. These names are always developing. So you could say developing Arabic, but never, nevertheless, that transitional phase between what we identify as the Nabataean script and what we identify as the Arabic script, we didn't find inscriptions like that. Just Paleo Arabic, which may suggest that in ancient time, in the, the Nabataean, let's say, uh, writing tradition didn't reach that far south, and that the Arabic script was imported to the region already fully developed at some point. Okay. Right. Okay. That could be the suggestion. And what we do find pre-Islamically in these areas are Thamudic inscriptions. All right. So so maybe we are seeing the replacement directly of Thamudic with fully formed Paleo-Arabic. We don't know. At the current moment, there are just there's no examples of uh, of this kind of transitional script. Yeah. OK. Can, can I jump in and just yeah. um, clarify maybe for those who are not so familiar yeah. with ancient yeah. Arabian and yeah. the development of the Arabic script? Um, I mean, there there is something remarkable that takes place. We're not speaking about religion here. We're speaking about script mm, uh, mm. in that um, up to and you can clarify me or correct, uh, clarify or correct me on the, the dating. But up to the fifth century, we have a whole a whole array of different scripts that are being used to write different forms of Arabic in what is now northern Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Syria. And then, um, you know, by the time we get into maybe the early 6th century, these scripts basically disappeared, disappear and are replaced by this proto or paleo Arabic script. Is that is that OK as a summary? Yes, yes, absolutely. Something something, uh, as we've said in previous interviews and I've said in, 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 in print in a couple of places, something uh, interesting seems to be happening in the 5th century that is creating um, at least in terms of writing, if we use writing as a measure of identity, let's just use that for convenience. Yes. There's something that's unifying, creating a unified identity across West Arabia and North Arabia. Um, West and, and North Arabia being defined from basically Najran and, and up. Okay, yes. there's you, you're starting to see the spread of a single writing system, single yes. I mean, there's local traditions, local schools, there it's not unified like you get later in the Islamic period. But what you also get too is beyond that. This is something that's really interesting is a unified era. So all of the dated inscriptions that we have so far are dated using the uh, era of Bostra. Okay. Uh, and you also get a sort of harmony in, um, in inscriptional formulae, the way people express, the, the, the way they structure their inscription, what they're saying. So all of this, if we yeah. can hear that in our inscription that we're yes, talking about absolutely. here, right? In both of the, yes. our inscriptions, both yes. of them begin. Uh, I mean, it probably in modern Arabic would be Bismikarabbana, yeah. something yeah. like that, in, in, which I translate as, or you translated, I, I quoted you, in your name, our Lord. So that would be an example of sort of a formula. 
That's a that's a formula, yes. And uh, and then the the next line too, the uh, tulsia, you know, the urging to be pious or or whatever towards that. That's also a formula that we get widespread. And th there are other ones as, as well. So this is so you look at that package: the spread of the script, the era, the formulaic expressions. We are not talking about coincidence. We're not talking about disconnected people just deciding to write random things, whatever comes to their mind. That the the uniformity across such a huge geographic area precludes coincidence. That they're they're really participating in some kind of shared culture that yeah. wasn't there before. Yeah, uh, because before almost every little oasis had its own script and dialect, and there, there was no unity uh, at all. So so something has triggered this, right? The, this is this is the. Uh, this is the fascinating thing we're after. Yeah, this is this is terrific. Um, mm -hmm. Haytham, can we start speaking a little bit about uh, about Hamzala, uh, perhaps? So Hamzala from the Prophet's biography, mm -hmm. and again, sort of the big question and the reason why there's a question mark in the title of your article is the first inscription that uh, you and uh, Ahmed have studied that uh, you um, uh, saw in Taif. Um, you know, it has this first person declaration. I am Hanzala. Um, and then I think, but maybe you can clarify the words son of does not appear, either Bad or Ibn does not appear, but you sort of infer it's there. And then the next uh, name is Abd Amr. So um, I don't know if you want to clarify a bit sort of the the names in the inscription itself, and then maybe introduce us to the Hanzala of the Prophet's biography. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I guess the first piece is with respect to the bin there, uh, it's there, but it's lightly carved and it doesn't really match the rest of the text. So uh, it's it's unclear to us whether uh, it could have been the same person who carved uh, the initial inscription, remember that they forgot bin and went back and carved it in, right. or it could be someone who came later on and added it. We can't right. be sure. That's why there's that uh, question mark around the, the bin part. Uh, but regardless, we have the two names. We have the name Hamdala, we have the name Abdam. And, you know, the question is, well, what do you do when you have two names like that? So I think Ahmed highlighted the temptation to immediately jump to linking that name with someone in the Sira literature or some uh, significant historical individual. Uh, the challenge there, of course, is the fact that, you know, if you have two generic names, like someone's name is John Smith or something, uh, you know, what is the, you know, what are the odds that the person who carved this inscription is the same person as the one you're thinking of in your mind, right? And so we have to be very cautious. And we kind of did a little bit of a double take there. So we, we kind of laid out uh, um, like sort of a priori, what do we, what considerations are there when it comes to thinking about the identity of the uh, individual named? And then what can we go through, like what, what do we have to look at in order to link that individual who's in the inscription with that historical individual, Hanbala, you know, the companion of the prophet. And so I would say kind of the first consideration to think about is like, how common are these names, right? So uh, the, the analogy I'd like to use is, I actually don't even remember the exact thing, but Elon Musk has a kid whose name is like XJ12Z, something like that. So if you were to see an inscription that had that, you know, been Elon, you know, what are the odds that we're talking about someone other than Elon Musk's uh, child, right? And so... Well, it doesn't work perfectly because Hanzala, as you described in the article, is a pretty common name, uh, especially in Medina, right? So uh, yes, yeah, so exactly. So the, so the question is how. So Hanzala is not a. Uh, it's, not, it's not actually a very popular name. And okay. when we do find it, uh, we find it associated. So in the biographical literature. So if you go look at genealogies, number one, it shows up in uh, among the Yathrabites, and in particular, concentrated among the Aus which is the tribe that this Hanbala, like the sort of the companion Hanbala is from. Yes. The other yes. thing is it does show up in the corpus coming from Darb al -Bakra. So it's a caravan route that links Hegra to Petra. And Leila Name did a bunch of work and others documenting uh, inscriptions there. And so that name shows up in the Nabateo Arabic corpus. Uh, and what's interesting there is you start seeing connections between names. So, uh, uh, if, you know, the, the Hanbala there, I believe, is son of Abd al-Ashhal. And what's really interesting is like, well, Abdel Esh is a very bizarre kind of name, but it also shows up in the genealogies of the Els tribe. And so what you start seeing is this sort of kind of re repetitive names that show up, you know, that that uh, um, uh, tend to be utilized again and again by tribes uh, or by a people. And the same thing applies to Habtaham. And so one thing we do is we say, well, let's let's look. So number one, we have this connection. We have the Hamdala names that show up that seem to also be tied to other names that we find coming from Yathrib. 
And then we have Abd Amr as a name. And we look at Abd Amr, uh, the distribution of that in the genealogy uh, um, works, we also find that it's concentrated among the people of Yathrib. And so just from the get-go, what we're looking at is, like if you were to say, well, maybe this is not the Hanvala, the companion, but it's very likely a Hanvala, you know, bin Abd Amr from Yathrib. And yeah. then the other thing is, yeah. given the fact, you know, the script and the formulae and things that Ahmed talked about, we can also localize this inscription in time. So now we're not just talking about any Yathrobite Hanbala bin Abd Amr. We're talking about a Yathrobite Hanbala bin Abd Amr on the basis of independent measures from a time period in which this other one existed. Okay, right? can can you can you clarify that? So uh, we have an inscription that refers to Hanbala uh, bin probably Abd Amr. We know that this name was used from the biographical dictionaries uh, among this particular tribe in, not in Ta'if, so that's a question to return to, but not in Ta'if, but in Yathrib, which becomes Medina, right? So those who don't know Yathrib is the pre-Islamic name for the city of Medina. Uh, but how do you, um, I mean, uh, you can generally identify the time period because as we were discussing, it's a Paleo-Arabic inscription. So the nature of the letters is different from the later standardized Islamic Arabic script. Uh, but how can you be more specific about the timing of the inscription? Haytham. Yeah. yeah, very good question. So, you know, the, again, so the first piece there is it's Paleo-Arabic. So it falls within a certain time period. We're talking fifth, sixth century time period, right? And then the formula as well that we're seeing, you know, the Bismika Rabbana, Ulsibi Birilla, et cetera, that falls, you know, again, in that same uh, corpus. But then here's a, other, another interesting piece. Uh, there are two pieces to this, which come to, which have to do with the names and both inscriptions. So the Hanbal inscription is first, and then you have the Abdul Uzza inscription beneath it, right? Yes. Uh, yes. And so now the question you can ask is, well, number one, uh, uh, and this is where you kind of have to look at both inscriptions holistically on the same boulder. So someone whose name is Abdul Uzza, could someone have conceivably been given that name in the Islamic period? Mm -hmm. I think okay, the answer... Can you explain a bit further, like, why would that be a problem? Who is Zal Uzza? Yeah, great, absolutely. So uh, essentially, it seems that um, there was this practice by the Prophet to kind of etymologize names and change the names of individuals whose names either had sort of a negative connotation or alluded to other, you know, pre-Islamic deities. So Uzza was one of the three uh, or two or three famous uh, Nabataean uh, uh, deities, Allat Manat Uzza, that get mentioned in the Quran, and kind of you, you sort of see in the in the uh, uh, epigraphic record a, uh, record a convergence upon the names of these uh, three particular deities to the exclusion of others, kind of like in, in the pre-Islamic period. And so a common name that you would get is the name Abdul Uzza, and that's the name we get in the inscription. Which means literally uh, the servant of Al Uzza. Of Al Uzza, exactly, yes. yeah. And actually, uh, this is a minor tangent. One really important thing, you know, Ahmed was talking about how these things circulate on the internet. Uh, this is, this was initially read as Abd Abdullah or Abdullah, uh, you know, and because the boulder is kind of broken there. And one thing we noticed was like a retroflex, uh, you know, to the yeah that other people had missed, especially when you're there and looking at it. And that changes things dramatically. Um, and so to kind of, that's a mild tangent, but just to kind of come back to it, what's mm -hmm. interesting is the idea is, you know, there's this uh, uh, very common theme across, you know, the, the the literature where the prophet would see, you know, would come to people whose names were unacceptable uh, to him and he would rename them. So mm -hmm. someone whose name is Abd Shams becomes Abd al Rahman. Mm -hmm. Someone whose name is this becomes something else. Uh, and we have like various records of, of that kind of thing occurring. And so what we think is like, you, okay, you someone... Tell, sorry to jump in, Hatham, but yeah. you and Ahmed tell the story of someone who refused to change his name. And uh, there's a comment about the, I don't know if it's the one who recorded the Hadith. So this clan, the descendants of this person have always had a rough character or something. Absolutely. That's a wonderful little anecdote. So it's actually Saeed ibn Musayyib himself. He's a famous Medinan jurist. And he is, you know, he talks about his own grandfather who became Muslim. And the prophet said, you know, your name is Hazan, which is like literally rough or tough, that kind of thing. He says, I want you to change your name to Sahel, you know, easygoing or Easy. soft. <laughs> and he said, I, he refused. And he says, I'm not going to change something, a name that my father gave me. And so Saeed laments this fact. And he says, oh, well, you know, we've been a tough people ever since. Because of uh, the name. meaning Exactly. Tough. So that kind of highlights a, a kind of a cultural shift that happens, you know, with the birth of Islam and a practice that was, you know, in, you know, put in place by the prophet. And the significance of this to the inscriptions is the fact that 
it allows us to kind of narrow things down and localize them a little bit better, right? So Abdul Uzza as someone's first name, very unlikely that this person is writing after Islam or after you can say after the conquest or the conquering uh, or the surrender, I should say, of Ta'if, right? Yes, so that kind of uh, uh, is one way to delineate things as well. Uh, and the other thing I forgot to mention actually is Abd Amr. So who's this figure Abd Amr? So Abd Amr uh, is the father of Hanbala in the in the in the Sira, uh, and he actually was was supposed to be like a Hanif, maybe a Christian. So he's someone who Tarahaba, you know, he he kind of uh, you know became a monk and he donned uh, al musuh you know, these uh, hair mantles. Uh, and he initially, when he heard of the coming of the prophet, kind of was very intrigued by this, and he he had this conversation with him, this exchange that's documented in, in Medina, in right? Talk. According to this. The... Yes, yes, exactly. When the prophet emigrates to, to Medina and, uh, uh, you know, he starts asking, what is this thing you come with? He says, Al-Hanifiyya. And he says, well, hang on a second. I'm on Hanifiyya. What is what is this thing you bring? And he's like, well, no, no, no. This is like the real Hanifiyya. And ultimately, uh, they didn't see eye to eye. And he he kind of rejected this uh, new religion that Muhammad was coming with. And so uh, uh, his name being Abd Amr uh, and his, his kind of kunya was uh, uh, Abu Amr. And then he became known as uh, Al-Rahib, and he became known as Abu Amr Al-Fasiq. Uh, so, but what's interesting is kind of there's can, this... Can I just, sorry, just explain those terms? Yes. And maybe we'll have a chance to circle back to the story a bit, because uh, it, as you note in the article, you and Ahmed, it forms a great contrast, the story of, of Handa himself. But uh, so Al-Rahib is the monk. So he gets the name, the monk, but uh, the, in Islamic sources, he becomes renamed as al Fasik. Is that right? Yes. So right. the, um, I don't know, uh, the unfaithful one or the devious one or the, yeah, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, is it okay? Hey, do you have something to wrap up or can I turn no, it no, back? No, we can, we can move on. Yeah. yeah, Ahmed, before we get more into the story of Hanza, Hanzala and his uh, father, um, uh, Haytham alluded to some of the language in these inscriptions uh, I mean, what do the actual words in the inscriptions uh, tell us? Um, for example, why does it start with a Bismillah? Why does this inscription not start with Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim but instead begins with Bismika Rabbana? That's a that's a, a beautiful question. Because you told uh, us this might be a companion of the Prophet, right? So yeah. So one might expect the Bismillah. Exactly. So I think that's one of the reasons... Uh, well, assuming when the Basmala is in introduced, but it's it's one of the reasons to imagine that this it goes along with the fact that he retains his original name and that this fellow Abdul Uzze with him as well has his original name. That these texts were carved uh, before they became companions of the Prophet, okay. or that is before they converted to um, became you know followers of uh, Muslims. And uh, uh, of course, there's a big big discussion of whether that's an appropriate term for the time period. But you know, for convenience, you understand what I'm saying. Yes. Uh, now, uh, let's see. Uh, the formula that they're using is actually typical formula uh, found in Paleo Arabic inscriptions, and it's one of the formula one of one of the examples of formulae that continues from pre-Islamic times into Islamic times. So it's the pre-Islamic, let's say, monotheistic a pious formula that actually continues, it's, it's not replaced, continues into and to be used by Muslims in the first, second, and onwards uh, Islamic centuries, unlike Bismi Karabbana, which uh, is not used um, as a as a general, I mean, it's known, it's used in, in sort of prayers, but it's not uh, <clears throat> the general way to uh, open a text. Now, uh, what's interesting about Bismi Karabbana, and this is in Taif, this is what's fascinating, so even though our man is, uh, let's say, traveling, uh, when in Rome, uh, right? Uh, he this use of rub here is also found in the Ria Zalala inscription. Okay, Barakna Rabbuna, right? So uh, no, Barakum Rabbuna. Sorry, not Barakna. Barakum Rabbuna. So may our Lord uh, bless you. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we have this use of rub here and uh, basically substituting for the name of God, which is Allah. And in these inscriptions, in the opening, we have Bismillah Karabbana, which, uh, as we discussed in the article, is related to the pre-Islamic uh, Qurashite uh, um, opening invocation, which was Bismika Allahumma. Right? So we know that form. So this seems to be an unattested, let's say, variant of that. Um, but of course, we can uh, identify this Rabb with Allah because of the next line, he says, Usi bi birrillah. So I urge you to be pious 
towards uh, or to, to have piety or uh, towards God, right? Um, this is, uh, and like we said, this is a uh, reoccurring formula. We find it a lot in the Paleo-Arabic inscriptions from north of Medina, near uh, between between uh, Medina and Tabuk, more on the Tabuk side, of course. Um, but in this area, uh, you have a number of inscriptions that begin that have this formula. So there's so there's um, uh, a very nice one where this where, where these individuals are actually there's a number of them where these individuals are writing to the tribe of Khazraj. We know this is one of the major tribes of Medina of Yathrib, um, uh, uh, the Ansar, right? Uh, and so these inscriptions will, uh, they're, they're set up sort of as letters, and they will address the uh, tr tribes members, uh, people from Khazraj. So they usually say something like, the guy gives his name, and he says, Kataba li bani al Khazraj. And he wrote to the, the people of Khazraj, right? And there's one beautiful inscription right south of Tabuk. We documented this during our trip. Ida ataytum ala makani hadha fala usikum bibirillah. Huh? So if you come to this place of mine, now, this, the grammar here is a bit strange because they're using a much zoom just of in a place we don't really get it in classical Arabic, but we'll put that aside. So let me urge you, it's the same formula, but just sort of a different mood. Let me urge you to obey uh, God, Billah, okay? God is spelled differently here, though. It's very important. We, we have time, we can come back to yes, that. Yes, we need to speak. But, um, but, yes. Uh, but yeah, so let me urge you to obey God. Other texts from the region, you get variations of these of this formula, usually, us usually using the jasif, fala usikum, let me do something, right? Another man writes to the Khazraj, uh, his name is Qais, uh, son of Ahmed, nice, uh, nice he writes to the Benedict Khazraj, and he says something like, fala usikum, bibir al-ilah, so I urge you to obey the God or to have piety towards the God. And then walayl, walbil, this word is hard to understand, and al quwa and uh, and might, power. So I like to take it as, as layl, but other people have different opinions. So the night and power, as you like, right? So this is a reoccurring formula. And we see how uh, these, these texts sort of fit the... Um, uh, well, the the linguistic environment yes. of the, yes. the of right before Islam, but there's something that's very important to point out okay. here, and the details matter. Those northern for, no, northern texts that use the Tausia, you'll notice that they use it in a way that doesn't act that is not actually attested in the Islamic period. Fala ulsi, let me urge you. Fala ulsi kum, right? It means the same thing. <laughs> in, in a sense, but it's not the exact same wording. <laughs> Whereas these two inscriptions attest the formula with the exact same wording that we yeah, get later in the Islamic period. Yes, Ulsi Bibir. So this is the exact same wording mm -hmm. that we get in the later Islamic period. So if we're so we even, you know, we're saying they're using the same formula. They're I like to use the term thought world. They belong to the same thought world. Okay. But the precise wording that we get in the Islamic period matches these texts. Yes. Okay. Which suggests, I mean, there's two interpretations of that, that the ones up north are a bit older. And that the formula had evolved to produce these, which is another mm -hmm. argument for why these are right on the cusp of Islam, right? Right there. Um, or the idea is it could be regional and it just speaks to uh, Islamic vocabulary and Islamic you know, pr uh, prayers and formula being drawn from something further south than Tabuk. No? So those are two interpretations. Okay. But, now, uh, about uh, you mentioned the sort of linguistic uh, mm. consequences mm. or mm. conclusions mm. one can draw from. Um, the nature of the wording in this inscription, uh, but maybe there's religious uh, conclusions one can draw as well. Uh, yes. You mentioned that the absence of the basmala potentially could mean that uh, this was an inscription from our Hamdallah uh, yeah. Ibn Abd Amr before yeah, yeah. he converted to Islam, mm -hmm. uh, but he's still using a monotheistic language, uh, Ahmed. So, Bismika uh, Rabbana. Uh, sounds very monotheistic. I think mm -hmm. you've argued elsewhere that the use of Rab um, is sort of a signature of uh, monotheistic inscriptions. Um, by the way, I mean, from what we can tell, I believe the Paleo-Arabic Paleo inscriptions tend to be monotheistic. So, um, I mean, is that can we draw that conclusion? Does this mean that there were monotheists, maybe Christians in uh, in the region around Mecca at this time? Very nice. So, um, <clears throat> all right. So let's uh, clarify exactly, because we use the term monotheistic and it's a convenient term. It's a conventional term. Yes. Um, 
what we mean by monotheistic precisely is that these inscriptions only call upon one god. Okay? This is important. They only call upon one deity. They're not... Uh, when we look at the Safiyyidic inscriptions, you have a list of 10 gods sometimes. Okay. If we look at South Arabian inscriptions, you even look at the inscription of Qariyat al Fau, right? Which is very nice. Uh, uh, there, it's a grave inscription. Who he calls on, he says, Right? And he, he put this grave under the protection of who? Kahan, uh, Allah, and Athar al So three gods there, uh, which is very nice. These these triads of gods are very popular. But that's what, the, that's what I would say is a polytheistic inscription or a pagan inscription where you see these they're calling upon many many deities mm -hmm. these inscriptions are calling on consistently only one god and in that sense every paleo arabic inscription we have is monotheistic mm -hmm. if they call on a god it's it's always the same one it's allah what's spelled in various ways those spellings are important what is missing from the paleo arabic inscriptions both in terms of uh, invocations and also from personal names is Rahman, or Rahman, or what have you. This is this name just does not exist in Paleo Arabic. Okay, right? It's very not very very interesting, right? Because it allows you to contextualize in a way the Meccans, if you it, it, sort of you know rejection of Ar Rahman as a divine name, right? In fact, that that attitude towards Ar Rahman as being sort of foreign and strange fits the Paleo-Arabic context because okay. you're just simply not there. And part of this story is that yeah. Ar-Rahman in maybe different forms mm. based on whether it's Arabic or ancient mm. South Arabian mm. is used mm. for the name of God in the south of the Arabian Peninsula mm. at this time and even earlier. Yes. I think the move yes. to monotheism takes place earlier in the south. Uh, yeah. But here we have different vocabulary to speak of the one yeah. God. Absolutely. And so they're they're monotheistic in that sense. But I'll push a bit further. They're not accidentally monotheistic, okay? It's not because these people were worshipping, you know, a whole pantheon of gods, but they just accidentally continue consistently invoke Allah or Al-Ilah spelled in various ways. It's not that. Because there's something else that's very interesting. All of these formulae, Ulsi bi birrillah, urge you to be biased towards God. Um, what, what is, 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 is We have one inscription from, uh, from also, uh, uh, what is it, west of Tabuk, um, inscription by another, perhaps, Qurashi, and we can talk about that later, maybe. Um, but this he, he invokes, Bismika Allahumma, okay? And then he, what does he say? Yastaghfiru Rabbahu. He seeks the forgiveness of his Lord. Okay, mm -hmm. very interesting. Mm -hmm. that we And we, again, once again, we see the continuity from this kind of pre-Islamic, let's say, uh, uh, pious vocabulary into the Islamic period. But, and, and we can go through all the formula, but what's interesting here, all of these things, barakum rabbuna, bismika Allahumma, all of these formulae are absolutely not attested in what we can be sure, uh, or what we can call uh, conventionally the pagan phase, the pagan period. Yeah. They're not there. Yeah. So it's not just the invocation of one God, but it's a complete transformation in your religious vocabulary, a complete transformation in the ideas you have about this one God, well, how you're supposed to act towards him, right? Be pious towards him, seek his forgiveness. Why do you need his forgiveness? Because you are a sinner. <laughs> this is, you see, this is the, the this is the thing that's missing. So, so we're there's not theology just behind the language here. There is a theology and there is a transformation. Yes. Okay. Yes. These are not, this is not a content in, in, in many ways or almost in all ways, these are not these Paleo-Arabic inscriptions are not simply the latest phase of pagan Arabian inscriptions in the Arabic script. They represent a complete overhaul mm -hmm. of you know, theology, um, re re religious ideology, worldview. The, your very relationship with the divine world has changed. Mm -hmm. And it's one that is in line with known monotheistic traditions of the time. You see, very, it's in line very, with that. It's compatible with that. <laughs> so we say what? We say, okay, so it's not just simply they're accidentally calling, but they've, it's a complete transformation. And that is why I would call, I think we would call these texts monotheistic. Yes. Okay. okay. That is why. Yeah. Okay. We, we need to return uh, eventually to the Allah question, the use of the Absolutely, Allah in yeah. this inscription. Yeah. But Haytham, first, I mean, just in light of what Ahmed was speaking about there, I can think of two applications of this uh, insight in regard to contemporary controversies around the emergence of Islam, the context of the Quran. Uh, one would be those who want to place the origins of Islam and the Quran further to the north. Um, you know, different scholars have advanced this idea. Uh, I mean, in part, it starts with Hagarism, I guess, but Stephen Shoemaker 
um, who on this channel, you know, has articulated his views for that. Others have as well. Um, I think there's a book that had some popularity in uh, on the internet uh, called The Geography of the Quran or something. I'm forgetting the author right now who argued that Petra was the place where it all started. So that's sort of one, the implications for that. How, how would you say this, uh, you know, in light of this inscription, what are, what are the implications for the theory of Islam beginning further north? But also there's the idea out there, uh, um, uh, which is a more traditional idea, that, uh, you know, the Hejaz was uh, still completely pagan, more or less, um, at the time of Islam's emergence. Um, you know, you note that Aziz al Azme in his magisterial book on the emergence of Islam in late antiquity uses the expression of pagan reservation. So could you speak about the implication of this inscription for both of those theories? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first one Ahmed, uh, you know, touched on earlier when he talked about you know, the distribution of inscriptions across Arabia and the fact that now really in the heart of the Hejaz, we have not one, not two, but several documented uh, Paleo-Arabic inscriptions. And I think that kind of puts to bed a lot of the questions around, well, you know, the absence of any sort of uh, not only, you know, Arabic inscriptions as we know them, but then also monotheistic or something that would uh, uh, be appropriately suitable for the emergence of Islam in, in the Hejaz. So we have this in Ta'if, we have an inscription between Ta'if and Mecca, and there's more to come. And so uh, I would say that sort of an argument from silence is also a very tricky thing because more evidence emerges. And one thing that I personally appreciated when I went, went out there and, and surveyed is how vast the landscapes are that we're talking about. And I mean, they're just enor enormous. And the amount of surveying that's been done is a fraction of a fraction of 1%. Uh, and so we really don't know what's out there. Uh, and there's more to come. But what we do find, just to be emphasized, what we do find so far has been consistent uh, uh, in its presentation, its formulae, uh, and its script, as, as Ahmed talked about. But I think there's another piece that links into this that answers the second part of your question around the pagan re reservation uh, uh, and Mecca and the Hejaz, which is that the, the name of the second inscription is Abdul Uzza, right? And so I think names, people put a lot of uh, um, weight on someone's name. And what's very interesting here is this person's name is Abdul Uzza, right? And so someone could jump at this in the same way they did at the Abd Shams inscription. Mm -hmm. So this proves, this proves there's a pagan around and yes. still worshiping but, al Uzza. But what is what does this person say? He says, he doesn't say Ulsi bi I mean, that would be great, <laughs> but he says Ulsi bi right? So that's the key thing. And so I think that, and I, Michael McDonald makes this point as well, is that look, the only thing we can glean from a name is that it's the name, right? And these are traditional names and the name doesn't mean anything except to identify that person, okay? And it's really what the person, right? And of course, I mean, it, it doesn't mean it doesn't contain linguistic information. We can't learn things about the etymology and all these other things. But what's very interesting here is this person whose name is Abdul Uzza is fall, falling within the exact parameters that we've defined for like this, this monotheism, this Arabian monotheism that uh, essentially kind of sits there at the dawn of, at the dawn of Islam. So it's very hard to make the argument if you were to want anything that would really confirm that pagan reservation thing, you'd want what I just said, like Usi or something. Yes. Yes. But in fact, you don't, you get the Rabbuna and you get the Allah. Um, Haytham, I want to ask a little bit more about the story of uh, Handala from the Sira, from the biography of the Prophet Muhammad. You alluded to this already. Uh, first, the story of his father. So, um, Abd Amar, or uh, you refer to this as a kunya, but sort of maybe a laqab, I don't know, maybe it is a kunya. Uh, you could explain uh, if you think it's important of Abu Amr. Uh, uh, he, um, so the father, uh, you alluded to this story that um, he is associated apparently with monasticism. This is kind of a topos, I think, in Islamic literature. You have more than one figure who is um, sort of called the monk of Islam. But there's some details here, right? Because as you said, uh, just from the, the article, you speak of traditions, Islamic traditions, which uh, say that uh, المسوح, which means he put on sort of the rough uh, hair garment uh, of a monk. Uh, and so, and then you told us the story of him uh, meeting, uh, meeting uh, the prophet and you use this phrase al Hanafiyyah, which means sort of like the original monotheism associated with Abraham. They're both kind of making claims. And eventually, according to the Islamic sources, the father of our, of maybe, our Handala, 
he uh, rejects the prophet, rejects Islam, and I think he even ends up in Byzantium. Is that right, Hatham? Mm -hmm. According to the story. Okay, so um, I don't know if there's anything more to add about that, but then in the article, sort of very dramatically, you and Ahmed said, say, well, the story of Hamdallah himself couldn't be more different. So I don't know if you have more to add about the father, but could you tell us a little bit about Hamdallah himself? Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to add one additional point here, which is that, you know, these, the, when we mention these stories, we take them as just that, right? So these are stories and they might add some richness and color to uh, um, kind of the material evidence that we have, but we can't put too much stock in them being sort of like, you know, historically reliable or their historicity, things like that. So I just, I, I think that's an important for the audience to appreciate. And we do make a point of that in in our paper. Uh, so Hamdaba, his son, uh, the son of uh, uh, Abd Amr, he uh, you know he accepts Islam. So he, he he's a I think an early an early Muslim uh, convert. He accepts the Prophet's message, uh, and he in fact uh, not only that he joins uh, the uh, army of Muhammad at the Battle of Uhud. Right. Uh, right. And at the time he was a young man. He ju had just gotten married, and he was intimate with his with his wife. And then he heard kind of the war cries, and he went out to battle, and he was killed. Uh, and the the thing that's emphasized in the sira is the fact that you know he had not had time to do like this uh, ghusl, so this you know ritual uh, washing. Uh, and as a result, the prophet spoke of him being washed by the angels. So he's ghasil al malaika, ghasil al malaika, um, the one yeah. washed by the angels, the ritual washing done by the angels because he wasn't able to do it himself before his martyrdom. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so incredible, yeah. incredible story. I mean, the story of the father and the son is just remarkable. I mean, it, aren't you tempted, Haytham, to to say, well, I mean, the story which makes Hamdallah's father a Christian and then potentially and then presumably Hamdallah a Christian himself. I mean, usually you follow the religion of your father. So Hamdallah before his conversion is maybe a Christian. And the inscription has this monotheistic language. I mean, I, aren't you tempted to connect the dots? You don't really go there in the article. You sort of don't don't show all your cards. But no, I mean that's kind of the that's the interesting thing, right? The interesting mm -hmm. thing is if so. Okay, so Hamdullah he dies in Uhud, which is like roughly three AH. So yes. like one would one would would one go to Ta'if to carve an inscription like this, especially at the time that they're hostile to the Muslims at the establishment of the Muslim state, and so. In all likelihood, if this were the Hanbala, it would have happened before, you know, uh, the establishment of that state. And so where would he yeah. get this vocabulary from? Now, of course, from a historical perspective, it would it would come from everything Ahmed talked about. Right. So this sort of cultural uh, uh, yes. uh, takeover of the area, things like that. But if we want to kind of romanticize it a little bit and look at the narrative, we can say that, well, you know, his father was a monotheist. Uh, and so he was probably a monotheist as well. And that language would have been something he grew up with. And that's why we would see that language on the inscription. But I, again, I, I do want to make a very clear uh, delineation between what we can understand and learn historically and what we can kind of glean from these kinds of stories. Yes. OK. OK. Uh, but Haytham, just speculating a bit more uh, in light of the biography of Hanthala that places him or makes him a Medinan, uh, why do we have this inscription in Ta'if? I mean, wouldn't it have been better to find it in Medina? That's a that's a very good question, uh, and so it comes down to a few things. So, is it unusual to find inscriptions of people far away from where they live? And the answer to that is no. Is that oftentimes people they carve inscriptions when they're traveling, uh, and um, we we have you know I mentioned or alluded to the this Darb al Bakra Ahmed talked about an inscription uh, we found in your Tabuk which mention mentions the Khazraj inscription that mentioned the Yathrobites, but they're they're further up north, and that one says. When you come to my spot here, so they're traveling. So people travel. They travel all the way up north and they go all the way down south. Yes, yes. And so really that distance between uh, uh, Yathrib at the time and Ta'if is not so substantial. Uh, in fact, the one the inscription you talked about earlier, the Khalid ibn al-As one, uh, the companion, I mean, who I think beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's very clear it's him. Uh, and that one's like, you know, several hundred kilometers south of Mecca where he was a governor. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's not unusual at all to find this. Uh, and it does bring up very interesting questions around, well, start if kind of this nexus of where people from Yathrib and Mecca and things like that, they might have met. And what what kind of historical context could that give to the emergence of Islam? How did it maybe have potentially begun in Mecca and migrated to Medina? All kinds of interesting questions like that. So, um uh, Ahmed, uh, we, as we mentioned earlier, we actually have two inscriptions. The 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 one writing the inscription identifies uh, 
himself in each case, and they're different names. Uh, are these different hands? Were these written by two people or one one person? I think that's uh we don't have a way to quantify that. So it's okay. just uh your feeling, your impression, which okay. is okay. Uh, not very useful. But I will add to uh <clears throat> what what Haytham just said. Um when we think of when we think of distances, we tend to imagine that kilometers on if you draw a straight line, kilometers on Google Maps, that that somehow communicates or, or equals uh, cultural distance. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't. What we really need to ask really is about cultural distances and connectivity. Is 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 Medina next door to Taif? Is Yathrib next door to Taif? And if you look north from Taif to, to Yathrib and you talk about major cultural settlements, I mean, they are basically next door to each other. Mm -hmm. This is that's where people, if people... That's the next yeah, one. If people are moving, that's that's the next town over. Huh? <laughs> I mean, there are small settlements or what have you, but you 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 follow me here. So um, so we need to think more in terms of cultural distance because that's the only thing that matters when we talk about mm -hmm. contact and diffusion. Um, it's uh, uh, the the reason the only reason why kilometers would equal would would, would somehow equal distance in in uh, in terms of cultural diffusion is if there's a lot of more important places to stop on the way. So that fewer people actually make it down to, let's say, five. But if there aren't, and if that's really the only places people are going, they they are they're going to functionally act like they're next door, mm -hmm. even though they might be, you know, several weeks journey. Right? Yeah. People will make the journey. I mean, you have nothing better to do anyway. And uh, there is um, also the matter of town of markets. So again, this is how it depends on how you want to handle the sources. Uh, you have we we know about the legendary Sukkur Okad, which is right north of Taif. Okay, it's right north of Taif. Now, do we know anything about it? Uh, did Qus bin Sa'idah really give his oration prophesizing the uh, <laughs> the appearance of uh, of Muhammad there? I don't. I mean, I don't know if we can say that, right? But it seems weird to me that again, like this character Hamdala, I don't get the feeling that people are just making up people and places out of nothing. At least this close in history. Further in the past, for sure, when they're talking about events that have happened a thousand years ago, yes, they're making things up from nothing. But you're, it doesn't seem like they're making things up from nothing when they're dealing with 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 events and places in the seventh century, right? So I would imagine that there is a marketplace called Urkab, an important one yes. that was right north of Taif. Yes. There's a good there's a good example or something that would draw in people from all over the place. And yes. of course, being right north of Taif makes tons of sense because if you go to Taif, you've got tremendous agricultural production south of it. You want to take those things and be able to sell them to people, all yes. your agricultural production. So it's a it's an ideal place, right? Yes. So there are really lots of reasons to come down here that don't have to be, uh, yeah, that, you know, that can be motivated economically and what have you. So I would say cultural distance is key. Yeah. Okay. Now there is one, I think, exceptional feature of the Arabic vocabulary in both of these inscriptions from Ta'if, and that's the reference to God as Allah. And, you know, viewers might be like, this is normal, God is Allah in Arabic, but actually in, in the Paleo-Arabic inscriptions, I think it's much more common to find uh, Ahmed, El-Ilah, uh, El-Ilah, so where you, the, uh, the, the, you have a differentiation between the definite article El and the name of God as Ilah. But here uh, you have, I believe, uh, just um, two lambs and a hay indicating Allah. Is that right, Ahmed? And Alif, why is this important? Uh, yeah, that God yeah, is yeah. referred to as Allah. Yeah, Alif, Lam, Lam, Ha, yeah. Oh, you have the Alif, okay. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so spelling matters because spelling tells you about education. All right, it tells you what your scribal background is from. And this is another thing that's actually, we should make this point. This was a very nice article that was published recently by Ma uh, Marayan Famputa, okay? Um, and <clears throat> he looks at the early Arabic inscriptions and he uh, notices something that is, I think, quite important for us to kind of measure the uh, significance of writing in this context and the educational background of the people who actually write inscriptions. The Paleo-Arabic inscriptions are not like Safiyyidic. So Safiyyidic is an alphabet, but it's a, the, the spelling is rather phonetic. People wrote the way they spoke. There wasn't, there weren't spelling rules and conventions. There was no complex thinking about morphology. Okay, people just wrote the way they spoke. So, for example, in Safiyyidic, the word ended in a ba, and the next word began in a ba. 
So for a Safiyidic writer, that just looks like one ba with a shadda. So they just write one ba. They're writing actually phonetically in that way. They're not even thinking yes. about word boundaries. Yes. Whereas the Paleo-Arabic inscriptions and the Quranic spelling as well, Marain points this out, it's a very good point, is orthographically sophisticated. Mm -hmm. It's not just writing the way you speak, but it speaks to an education where people have to think about their language, they have to think linguistically mm -hmm. and be able to analyze words linguistically to spell them properly. Yes. And one example of that is the word Allah. Okay, so Allah, if you were to just pronounce it, is Alif, Lam with a Shadda, and Aha. This is how you would pronounce it. And this is indeed how it gets written in Nabataean. So Allah is, is a very common in, in Nabataean theophoric names, and it's written that way, Alif, Lam, Ha, only. Okay, Safiyyidik, also with one Lam. In the Qariyat al inscription, actually there, there's not even a, an Alif, it's just Lam, Ha, Walla. Huh? <laughs> so phonetic. But in these inscriptions, there are two lambs. Why are there two lambs? Because the scribal school, the education teaches you yes. that if a word has a definite article, you need to write the definite article separately, no matter how it's pronounced. So if the lamb, because in Arabic, the definite article is alif lamb, and the lamb assimilates, well, in some Arabics, okay, fine, the lamb will assimilate to uh, certain letters that follow it, that come from the front of the mouth, such that the lamb is not pronounced. So, ashams, right? And if you were writing phonetically, you would spell ashams, alif, sheen, mim, sin. But when you're educated, you're able to identify that's the article, and there you write alif, lamb, even though you don't pronounce the lamb. So, you're not writing phonetically, you're writing morphologically. Yes. And actually, the, this is not an isolated example. The Arabic script is filled with morphological writing, which is the result of an education, mm -hmm. which is the result of a scribal school where people are being deliberately taught to write. So then you say, well, what are the economic conditions that make it possible for such schools to exist? Writing is a central part of functioning of society. You need writing for, to fun for society to function if you are training people in the sophisticated way to do it. Okay, I mean, so this, this is, here, I just want to emphasize how important yeah. it is because it yeah. speaks to uh, from a sort of small example of how this one word is written, but yeah. it speaks to the possibility that there's a scribal culture in there. The there is, yes, absolutely. The way these things are written, this is a scribal culture. This is not learn the alphabet and write, you know, your feelings. No, 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 no. this is a scribal culture. And uh, so Allah, so here it's spelled with two lambs, the two lamb spelling is not phonetic. This is morphological spelling. It tells you that speakers, when they're saying the name Allah, that they're actually parsing it as alif lam, the definite article, and la. So whatever you want to talk about the etymology of Allah, the way speakers understood it at this time, they understood it as two separate morphemes. Mm -hmm. Al, definite article, and this word la, mm -hmm. which is just the which is demonstrably the contraction of ilah, God. So Allah in this context, is really a Western Arabian dialectal pronunciation of al-ilah. Right? They're the same thing. Yes. But it doesn't matter if they're necessarily the same thing. Uh, keep They do sound different. And al-ilah in the Paleo-Arabic inscriptions, where it's written out that way, is clearly associated with Christianity. So all of our clearly Christian Arabic texts mm -hmm. Inscriptions, have, uh, for example, that actually have a cross. For that have a cross, absolutely. Yes. Have, have a cross. These one Jews, Al-Ilah. Whereas these, let's say, more ambiguous monotheistic texts, they use Allah. But the spelling Allah, this morphological spelling with the Alif Lam and then the Lam Ha, okay, this, this, this complex spelling, is... Probably something that we might put south of, uh, let's say, Medina, Medina, Mecca, this southern part, central southern part of the Hejaz. Mm -hmm. Because when we go north to the area, to the inscriptions that are clustered around Tabu, the south of Tabuk in this area, they are also calling God Allah most of the time. There's one inscription with Alila. We get, we can talk about that. But they're mostly calling God Allah. But in these cases, they spell it Alif Lam Ha or Lam Ha. And then there's this weird spelling that looks like ya lam ha. Now there that we can put that can be interpreted in many ways. But the fact is they're not spelling it alif lam lam ha. 
Okay, so for example, um, there's a beautiful inscription. Uh, this one has only been published online. We did not find it. Hey, hey, when I went back out around Tabuk to read to document some of these texts, this one we did not have any clue as to where to find it. But it's so important. It's one of these inscriptions where the guy is calling on the Khadzaj and all of this, and he tells them, "O Sikum bi do all these good things. Qital al qaw or Qital al adu, fight the enemies, and lots of Arabian values." And at the end, he says, "Fahayyakum rabbukum." So may uh, your Lord grant you long life or greet you, have you like, for God, Allah is the best at doing so. Okay, so this is, again, this is the kind of vocabulary we, we know from later. But here Allah, written independently, is just written Alif Lam Ha. Mm. Okay, we know this text is from somewhere in the mm -hmm. in the neighborhood of Tabuk, but as uh, Aitham said, that's a big neighborhood. Okay, uh, so, so it's really this spelling here that speaks to a southern region of the Hejaz. And that is no, then maybe it is no coincidence that that's the writing school. That spelling is found in the writing school used to put down the early Qurans and also the early Islamic writing school. Although you get some variation there in the early, in, in, in early Islamic texts, which is interesting. Uh, so, so in a way we can sort of uh, speak to the scribal background of the Islamic writing school looking at these texts it doesn't come from tabuk it doesn't come from from jordan it doesn't come from uh Najlan, but rather it comes from the hijaz yeah yes. uh, well i i just like to commend uh the article to to everyone um i mean it's really noteworthy that in the article um ahmed and haytham have a very sort of sober analysis of the inscription and some of the linguistic historical and religious questions associated with it but are very careful not to uh, go too far. Um, nevertheless, uh, the possible implications, I mean, we're on YouTube, so we should uh, be a little bit speculative. I mean, the possible implications for this inscription are really incredible for what it says about uh, the context of Islam's origins, implications for uh, trust in the Sira, also for the possibility of more monotheists than we might expect in the context of Islam's origins, uh, and maybe also something about a scribal, a scribal culture. Uh, so um, the article, again, friends, is a Paleo-Arabic inscription of a companion of Muhammad. It's in the Journal of Near Eastern Studies. We will link to it in the description. Uh, Haytham, great having you with me. Thanks for, thanks for your insights, for being part of uh, exploring the Quran and the Bible again. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ahmed, as well. Uh, it's always a pleasure. I hope it hope it will be uh, a continuing series to have both of you on and uh, really appreciate your insights. Thank you.